and good afternoon to everyone tuning in to TV Courtroom, hosted by yours truly, attorney Michael Cord, a.k.a. Michael X, a.k.a. the angriest black man in America. As you know, this is the first Friday of February, which means everybody's celebrating Black History Month. So, of course, we're going to do a segment today on Black History Month, but there's a twist to the Black History Month that we're doing here. In other words, it's not the stereotypical um, Black History Month where we say, okay, um, Dr. King did his I Have a Dream speech and uh, Rosa Parks wouldn't get up uh, from the back of the bus, and um, that's the end of the lesson today. No, that's not the end of the lesson today or any time when we here at TV Courtroom talk about Black History Month, we're talking about what I call world history every day. Let me repeat that. Here at TV Courtroom, we don't call it Black History Month, period. We call it Black History Month is world history every day. And I'm going to break that down to you. And also because it's Black History Month, as they say, I'm going to provide a, um, a service to the Black community and to others. Um, I'm going to provide free legal advice. So if you want to call up today, correction, I'm thinking about my radio courtroom show where people call up. This is the TV courtroom show. By the way, just as I do this show, TV courtroom, the first Friday of every month, I have a show called The Radio Courtroom. That's every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at WURD 96.1 FM. And I kind of sort of do a similar thing. I provide a community service and I do it for free and I do it to enlighten the masses, to help the oppressed classes to rebel. So when I do this TV courtroom thing, and again, it's the first Friday of each month, I try to arm you not with destructive weapons, but to arm you with constructive weapons. And by that, I mean enlightening information as we're going to share with you today. Now, I say we because I'm hoping it's going to be a two-way street. I have my phone here and... Uh, if you have any questions about my first topic, which is the whole notion of Black History Month, or my second topic, which is free legal advice, you need to contact me by Twitter or Instagram. And you can reach me at Twitter at Michael Cord, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-O-A-R-D, Michael Cord. That's my Twitter handle. And it's the same for Instagram. So just go to Twitter, go to Instagram and say, hey, I got a question about criminal law and just say my boyfriend was arrested last week and I haven't heard from him. What's the process? How does the court system work? Or my girlfriend thinks she's going to be charged. The police are asking her to come in to give a statement. She doesn't know what to do. So just contact me on Twitter or Instagram as our intrepid and thorough and extremely professional producer Roland has posted right there on the screen. Twitter, Instagram at Michael Cord, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-O-A-R-D. And just pose a brief question. I don't need a dissertation. Just say, uh, what happens during an interrogation? Or when should I expect my trial to take place? I got arrested last week. Or what's the difference between Delaware County Courts and Philadelphia County? Just basic one sentence questions. And I'll be happy to go through Twitter, go through Instagram. I'll see your question. I'll see your comment. And I'll be happy to respond. So you can do that right now. But the first part of today's show will be the whole Black History Month thing. And then the second part will be the Q&A regarding any type of legal matter. It could be criminal stuff, which I have an expertise in. It could be domestic relations. It could be real estate. It could be parking. It could be civil litigation. And if I don't know the answer to those other things, because again, my lane, my area of expertise is criminal defense, but I know a little bit about every other type of law. And I know a lot of other attorneys that specialize in those other types of law. By the way, 
those of you who might not be able to ask the question by way of Instagram or Twitter, just email me and I'll be happy to get back to you after the show. Michael Cord, the letter X, as in Malcolm X, Michael Cord X at gmail.com and say, yo, Mike, I couldn't get to you on Twitter, Instagram doing the show, but I got this question. Can you explain it or can you put me in touch with somebody else? And again, I produce extraordinaire, roll and post it there on the screen, Michael Cord X at gmail.com. So, let me go through the agenda today. First part of the show, the whole Black History Month thing. Second part of the show, Q&A regarding any questions you might have regarding the law. And in regards to the Q&A, you can start posing your questions right now on Twitter, right now on Instagram, or right now by way of email. And I'll be happy to get back to you either immediately or shortly after the show. So let me start at the beginning. And I literally mean the beginning in connection with uh, Black History Month. And I say at the beginning because Black history didn't begin with slavery. Slavery interrupted Black history. And repeat that. Black history did not begin with slavery. Quite the contrary. Slavery interrupted Black history. And we got to put that in context. I love the whole notion of Black History Month, but folks need to understand that our history didn't begin with slavery. And the father of Black History Month, Carter G. Woodson, he explains it perfectly. So get your pens out, get your pads out, because we're going to have a lesson for the next 30 minutes, Black History Month 101, what it is and what it ain't. I can start with the what it ain't right now. Let me do that part. Black History Month is not about slavery exclusively, and Black History Month is not just a thing in February. That's pretty easy. So if you write that down in the test I'm going to give you at the end of the show, you'll get a high grade for it. What Black History Month is, what Black History Month is not. It is not exclusively about slavery. It is not just the February thing. That's the not part. Now let's get to what it is. Black History Month is world history every day. Black History Month is world history every day. And earlier in the show, when I said I'm going to start from the beginning, I literally mean the beginning, the beginning of humankind. There's a gentleman who is an international scholar who is a preeminent historian and who is a prolific author. He's written about 100 books. Most people haven't even read 100 books. This gentleman has written about 100 books and they're all pertaining to African-centered history. And there was a uh, lecture that this person by the name of Dr. Molefe Kete Asante he held a Zoom lecture on January 7. I'm sorry, January 9. It was January 9. And during that January 9 lecture, which he did via Zoom, he said something that many people, I'm sure, were surprised by, but um, they don't challenge it. Why? Because he's an international scholar, because he's a preeminent historian, because he's a prolific author who has written about 100 books about African-centered scholarship and history and anthropology. And here's what he said. Africans were the first human beings on the planet and they were at the Nile Valley region of East Africa. Wow. And just so we're clear, even though Dr. Asante is an African-centered black scholar, they are Eurocentric white scholars who agree with him that the first human beings were from Africa. In fact, Louis Leakey, one of the greatest European scholars and historians in history, Louis Leakey said, yeah, I'm a white guy, but uh, I have to concede that the first human beings, and I say human beings, I mean homo sapiens. I mean people that walked upright like we do. So the first human beings, the first homo sapiens, the first persons or creatures who walked upright 
They were Africans. And these Africans existed 300,000 years ago. If that surprises you, and by the way, that's a historical and anthropological fact. If that surprises you, I'm sure this will also. For 75% of that 300,000 years, 75% of that time, that equals 225,000 years. There were only black people from Africa on the planet. In other words, the earth was Africa and Africa was the earth. Nobody else existed. I'm going to explain to you because you're probably saying, well, what about all these other continents? And what about Pangea? And what about these different ethnic groups? Where, where did they came, come from? They came from Africa, ultimately, because the first human beings were in the Nile Valley region of East Africa 300,000 years ago. And they stayed there for 75% of that time, which means for 225,000 years, just Africans on the planet in Africa, nobody anywhere else. And then about 75,000 years from today. So remember the clock we're talking about. The clock begins 300,000 years. And for 225,000 years of that 300,000 years, just Africans in Africa. And then a new human being came into existence about 75,000 years ago. Those are the other ethnic groups we talk about. You might say, well, Mike, what are you telling me? Where do they come from? It's called the out of Africa. And many people say it's a theory, but it's clearly a fact. Because what happened is this. Those Black people in Africa 300,000 years ago, and during that 300,000 years, 225,000 at the time, they had skin like mine. They had hair like mine. They had lips like mine. They had nose like mine. Primarily it was the skin and the hair. Why? Because they were in Africa, damn it. And in Africa, it's a tropical climate. And there's a sun beaming down that explains all the great vegetation you have around you, the abundance of vegetation. So with the sun's ultraviolet rays, humans needed melanin to provide a covering for the skin, needed hair to provide a protection from the sun's ultraviolet rays. So that melanin is what creates this protection. That melanin is what creates the head, the scalp from those ultraviolet rays. So for 200,000 years, it was just us doing our thing. And this is where the theory part of the fact comes in. It's not clear why, but a group of Africans decided they wanted to trek beginning northward out of Africa. And as they begin to trek northward out of Africa, they begin to leave that bright, sunny, tropical environment. And after they finished their trek, they were out of Africa into a rainy, cloudy, overcast, chilly environment. And since there was no sun to be had, no real sun, then there was no need for the melanin that creates this beautiful color and this beautiful hair. So those other people began to look different, not because they were worse than us, not because we were better than them, but because the environment they were in was different. And you adapt to your environment. So you don't need that melanin. So your skin becomes lighter and your hair becomes thinner and, and stringier. And that's nothing disparaging. That's just an anthropological fact. So that's where the difference came from. It came from the environment. It came from people leaving Africa and traveling elsewhere. And that's how today we have the different peoples with different physical appearances. So I'm sure that's shocking. Again, you don't have to believe me. I'm just that angry black guy, attorney Michael Cord, AKA Michael X, AKA the angriest black man in America. But don't believe me. But when you come across a 
an international scholar and preeminent historian and prolific author like Dr. Molefe Kete Asante, when you come across great Europe Eurocentric minds like Louis Leakey, probably the greatest anthropologist to come out of Europe. When and and he and Dr. Asante obviously don't think alike, or, or he's Leakey's no longer around, but obviously wouldn't think alike on a number of things. Probably if there are a hundred issues, they might disagree on 99 of them. Obviously, Dr. Asante would be right on those 99, but the one difference but the one I should say similarity, if there's 99 differences, the one thing that they come together on and agree, a black scholar and a white scholar, the greatest in their professions, is that Africa is the cradle of humankind. Dr. Sante, as I told you, said Africans were there 300,000 years ago in the Nile Valley region of East Africa. And for 225,000 of those 300,000 years, there was nobody anywhere else. That's why I say the world was Africa and Africa was the world. Think about that for a second. That's some powerful stuff right there. But it's not, that's why when I started this discussion, I said, hey, this is going to be about Black History Month to explain that Black History Month is really world history every day. What do I mean by that? In addition to Africa being the cradle of humankind, it's also the cradle of civilization. When I say it's the cradle of civilization, if I had time, I could go through a list of hundreds, maybe even thousands of inventions that came out of Africa, creations that came out of Africa, discoveries that came out of Africa, developments that came out of Africa. But let me just give you a few. And folks, you got to write this down. It's going to be a test at the end of the show. By the way, I almost forgot. If anybody has any questions or you want to make some comments about this discussion, you can. But as I pointed out earlier, if folks have any questions or comments about um, the legal system and they have questions about primarily criminal law, but if you want to ask questions about civil law, want to ask questions about parking law, about domestic relations slash family law, about administrative law, contact me as Roland made it clear on Twitter and Instagram at Michael Cord, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-C-O-A-R-D. And I'm checking my Twitter and Instagram to see if there are any questions or comments. And if I have enough time, I'll certainly get to them. Um, and if folks don't have enough time to contact me now at Twitter, and Instagram, it's no big deal. Don't worry about that. And the reason that you don't have to worry about that is because you can email me. You can email me at michaelcordx at gmail.com. That's michaelcordx at gmail.com. And if you contact me at michaelcordx at gmail.com, the same way I'm doing this TV show right now, here in my home studio, and I'm not being interrupted by anything because I make sure it's just me and you, and it's no interruptions by anybody else. I make sure that I give you all the time to ask questions by way of Instagram, to ask questions by way of Twitter, or to ask questions by way of email. And the show goes on for about an hour from 3.30 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. After 3.30, I can go about my business and you all can go about your business. Bottom line is this is a community service to make sure that not only are you armed with illegal information, but you're also enlightened with cultural information about what we're discussing now. Black History Month is world history every day. Now, remember the last thing I said. I said that Africa is the cradle of humankind because the first human beings on the planet were from the Nile Valley region of East Africa. And for 200,000, 225,000, that's 225,000 of those 300,000 years, it was just Africans on earth, which means Africa was the earth and the earth was Africa. But it's not just a matter of Africa being the cradle of humankind. It's also the cradle of civilization. Check this out. I'll do maybe, I don't know, 10 to 15 of the hundreds or thousands of 
inventions and creations and developments and discoveries. I'll do about 15 of them, 10, 15, maybe 20 in alphabetical order. Agriculture. Agriculture was created in the Napta Playa region of Egypt. And I'm going to use the word Egypt, but really it's not Egypt. It's actually called Kemet. The indigenous people in that North African country called it Kemet. They didn't call it Egypt. When the Greeks came, the Greeks decided to call the people Egyptians. Why? Because in the Greek language, Egyptos means burnt faces or dark faces. So the Greeks saw the people of Kemet and, you know, Europeans being Europeans, they decided they had to name stuff. You know, just like the red brothers and sisters here in the land we call America, people call them Indian. Why? Because Christopher Columbus in 1492 saw them. He thought he was in India, so he called them Indians. That's a European thing. They figured that only they, that something is not discovered until it's discovered. Those red people had been on this planet for thousands and thousands of years. They weren't discovered. They were around before the Europeans were. Anyway, I digress. So agriculture comes from the Napta Playa region of Egypt slash Kemet, 9500 BC. And when I say 9500 BC, what I mean is before the Christian era. And I got to admit to you all, um, I don't really like that notion of BC. No disrespect to Christians, but why does the calendar start with the so-called birth of Christ or birth of Jesus? It's like, why is that the yardstick by which time is measured? We in Africa, for example, had our own indigenous spirituality. As a matter of fact, and this is a, a, this is a historical fact, there were anthropologists and, and scholars and researchers who found on the walls of Egypt slash Kemet hieroglyphics, better stated metal nature, written on the walls, on the caves in Egypt. And on these walls, there were stories about Asar and Aset and Heru or Horus. That was the original Holy Trinity. So at least 2,000 years, at least 2,000 years before the birth of the man that we call Jesus or Jesus Christ or Yahshua ben Yosef or whatever you want to call him, at least and probably longer, but at least 2,000 years before his birth, Africans in North Africa were acknowledging Horus, Asar, and I'll say the Holy Trinity. And they were talking about the Immaculate Conception. And they were talking about the resurrection 2,000 years before Jesus was born. So when we talk about time today, for example, this is year 2020. But is it really 2020? What's 2020? Because we say it is 2,020 years since Jesus was born. But again, why do we have to acknowledge the Jesus thing? Why not the stuff that we were worshiping in Africa or they were worshiping in Asia or wherever else? But anyway, that's a whole issue. And I digress. I don't a whole separate issue. And I digress. I don't want to get distracted. But for the sake of discussion, we're going to use the B.C. thing, the before Christ thing and the A.D. thing and O Domino. So agriculture, as we know it, herding animals and plants and doing all that stuff that was developed and created in the Napta Playa region of Egypt slash Kemet. 9500 BC, about 10,000 years, almost 10,000 years before the birth of Christ. What about algebra? Algebra also in Egypt slash Kemet by a man named Ahmez, and that was 1500 BC. What? Algebra came out of Africa? Damn right it did. If you don't believe me, research your brother by the name of Ahmez. His name is spelled A H M E S. Uh, we talked about agriculture. We talked about algebra. What about architecture? Yes, building stuff, gigantic buildings and the pyramids. You guessed it, came out of Egypt slash Kemet by a man named Imhotep. And that was 2600 BC. Imhotep ar architecture, 2600 BC. You want more? I got more. 
And think about it, because when we think about Africa, people call it ignorant people. By ignorant, I mean unknowing. They call it the dark continent. What do you mean the dark continent? It was enlightenment everywhere. While Europeans were crawling through the caves and painting their skin blue and howling at the moon, Europeans there doing that thing, the howling at the moon, the painting the skin blue and crawling through the caves. In Europe, place we now know as Europe, Africans in Africa were creating agriculture and algebra and architecture. You want more? I got more. What about astronomy? That again was in the Nabta Playa region of Egypt slash Kemet. In fact, there was where the world's first astronomical site was built, 7500 BC. And I'm going to tell you which authors you can research so that you will have confirmation that this stuff I'm talking to you about is not just the words of an angry black man. Instead, it's me repeating what respected, worldwide respected scholars have said about these subjects. So we talked about agriculture and algebra and architecture and astronomy. What about calculus? Yeah, calculus came out of Africa. In fact, again, in Egypt slash Kemet by a brother named Tishome. And Tishome came up with this calculus 1500 BC. And by the way, when I say Egypt, again, that's what the Greeks call it. So that's what the world calls it. It was really Kemet. But whether you call it Egypt or Kemet, it's in North Africa. Why do people today talk about Egypt as in the Middle East? What the hell does that mean? They know that there have been such great inventions and discoveries in Egypt, which is in Africa. It's in North Africa. But if they give credit to the Egyptians or the people of Kemet, then they're giving credit to the people of Africa, North Africa. You can't have that because then you're conceding that black folks have it going on and had it going on for a very long time. So what they do when they talk about Egypt, they take it out of North Africa and put it in the Middle East. Some weird, weird stuff there, but let's keep it moving. The calendar. The calendar as we know it, and you need to Google this because this is some interesting stuff, really came from something known as Adam's calendar. And Adam's supposedly the first human on the planet, but it goes by the term Adam's calendar. It's as old as the first human on the planet. Because the first human planet began to realize that he or she, probably a she, um, had to figure out time. And people say, well, if there was one human being, where did the second human being come from? And what you have to understand is that we as humans, and this is where evolution comes in, I'm going to stay in my lane, I'm just going to give you the little bit that I know. Obviously, we come from the water. That's where all life begins, water. And then as fish, we begin to come out of the water, onto the shores, and then begin to climb. And some begin to fly, and others develop into running, and then walking, and then being mobile, upright. And that's where the humans came in. So we come from fish. So it was those creatures that initially came out of the water onto the land, existed in a pre-human form, developed into a human form. And it wasn't just one, just like there wasn't one fish, damn it. There obviously wasn't just one human. Just like there wasn't just one ape, there wasn't one just one human. And these creatures began to develop. And as they developed into these different species, just like fish multiply and birds multiply and Gorillas multiply and zebras multiply. So did these newly developed Homo sapiens. And when they began to see each other, they had the natural urge to procreate. So that's where we came from. So once they began to procreate and multiply, they obviously had some form of communication. And to the extent that they were mobile people, they didn't just remain stationary here. They had to hunt and fish and do that. And based on how the earth turns, day became night and night became day. So they had to figure out, okay, how many darknesses, let's use that phrase that I'm making up right now, darknesses. How many darknesses were there before my mate came back from hunting? 
let's use this, make up the term likenesses. How many likenesses were there before my mate came back? So obviously there wasn't a March 19 or January 12th. It was a matter of day, that's light, and dark, that's night. So somebody would leave here to go there to hunt, to fish, do whatever, and then come back. Did it take this person a half of a darkness, a half of a lightness, or two darkness, or three lightness? So from that came a initial and... I don't want to say it was primitive because that's an insulted term, but let me say basic. It was a basic kind of calendar. And this basic kind of calendar was just listing how much time passed before something happened. And that's why the first calendar is about 300,000 years. It's known as Adam's calendar. Do the research. You want more? What about cotton? Cotton to be used as a type of clothing was developed in Eastern Sudan, which we know today as Nubia. That's the term that we should be using, but people call it Sudan, really it's Nubia. That was 5,000 BC. So think about what we just talked about. And it's about 401, so I'm gonna wrap this up in the next five, maybe 10 minutes. Then the last part of the show, I'll get into legal information. And while I'm talking about that right now, let me just check to see if we have any questions from anybody about any legal issues. And uh, I see a couple here and I'm gonna to try to get to all of them, but if I don't get to all of them, if I don't get to all of them, I will be happy to respond to emails. Again, Michael Cord Instagram, Michael Cord Twitter, and by email, Michael Cord X, Michael Cord X at Gmail. Dot com. If you have any questions about the legal stuff, I'll get to that toward the end. So we talked about agriculture and algebra and architecture and astronomy and calculus and the calendar and cotton all coming out of Africa. But there's more. What about, for example, medicine? Medicine came out of Africa. And this is where I got to give Europeans credit. They know how to jack stuff. They know how to take stuff. They know how to steal stuff and claim credit for it because I was taught in school and I went to a great school before I obviously went to Cheney and went to law school. I was a student at Masterman and Masterman is one of the top has always been one of the top 10 schools, not just in Philly, not just in Pennsylvania, not just in the East Coast, but in the country. And despite going to Masterman, I didn't get the proper, the accurate education. I was taught that. Hippocrates was the father of medicine. But as I got older and got into college and read stuff by people like Diasante, I found that, that no, Hippocrates was not the father of medicine. Hippocrates actually came about, his existence was around, well, let me just read to you what I wrote. In fact, speaking of reading what I wrote, there's an article I wrote about this, about this Black History Month stuff, um, in the Philadelphia Tribune, because I won't have enough time to go through the complete article during the show. So I encourage you to go to phillytrib.com. That's philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y, trib, T-R-I-B, phillytrib.com. And when you get to that site, just type in CORD, C-O-A-R-D, and Black History Month. phillytrib.com, CORD, uh, Black History Month. And once you do that, you'll be in a position to get enlightened. By the way, we got about maybe 25, 26 more minutes for the show. And once I finish this at 430, I'll be checking my Twitter. I'll be checking my Instagram and I'll be checking my email to see what questions you all might have about any of this stuff. Not just the legal stuff I'm going to get into, but also this Black History Month stuff. So here's what I wrote in that article. The father of medicine was not Hippocrates, a Greek who was born in 450 BC. Instead, it was Imhotep, an Egyptian, a Chemite, who lived 2,200 years earlier in 2680 BC. Let me break that down. If you research or Google Hippocrates, a Greek, you'll see that they claim he was the father of medicine. 
but they completely ignore a man who was around 2,200 years earlier, not in Greece, but in Africa, a man by the name of Imhotep, that's spelled I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Google that, research that, and you'll find out that that man, that Black man, that African, Imhotep, was the real father of medicine who was around in Africa over 2,000 years before Hippocrates was in Greece. So we talked about agriculture and algebra and architecture and astronomy and calculus and the calendar and cotton and medicine. And let me just list a few more before we wrap things up with this. What about religion as we know it? Well, in Africa, we had our spirituality where there were a number of deities. But if you're talking about religion in terms of monotheism, the belief in one God, that came out of Egypt slash Kemet 1300 years before Jesus was born. So even the whole one God thing came out of Africa. And what about writing? You know, people often talk about they didn't write anything in Africa. It was an oral tradition. Well, yeah, we did have an oral tradition, but we were writing. In fact, we invented writing in the Sudan. We call it the Sudan today, but it's actually known as Nubia. And there's documented evidence that the first form of writing, as we know it, was 5,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ in Africa, in what we call today Sudan, or was known back then as Nubia, 5,000 years ago. And I noticed from the time, it's about four or six. Let me speed this up. So we talked about all this great stuff out of Africa. But what about what happened here in America? Despite slavery, despite Jim Crow, despite sharecropping, we did our thing here in America. There's some inventions and creations and discoveries and developments by Black folks that you'll be shocked to find out about. By the way, I put together a document called We Did It, They Hit It. We did it, D-I-D, we did it. And by we did it, I mean we invented it. We created it. We discovered it. Then the second part of that is they hid it. The American education system hid, H-I-D, hid it from the world and especially from us so that we wouldn't know anything about it. So think about that for a second. We did it. They hid it. If you want a copy of that, we did it. They hid it document, which includes all these inventions, all these discoveries, all these creations. Email me at michaelcordx at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-H. A E L C O A R D, the letter X at gmail.com. That's M I C H A E L C O A R D, the letter X at gmail.com, and say, Hey, Mike, I'd like to get a copy of that. We did it. They hit it document, which includes all the stuff I'm about to share with, with you and more. The air conditioning unit design, a black man named Frederick Jones in 1942. The dry cleaning process, where we take our clothes to a dry cleaner and they come back looking brand new, that was Thomas Jennings. He did that in 1821. And when Thomas Jennings did that in 1821, remember, slavery didn't end, supposedly, until 1865 with the 30th Amendment. Well, about 40 years, over 40 years before that, Thomas Jennings, a black man, was inventing the dry cleaning process. And by the way, Thomas Jennings was the first black person to receive a United States patent for any invention. So we just talked about air conditioning unit. We just talked about dry cleaning. What about the modern day elevator? Yep, a black man, Alexander Miles, did that in 1887. What about GPS? That stands for the Global Positioning System. That was Gladys West. You talk about a mathematical and a mathematical a mathematical and engineering genius, that was Gladys West. She did this sometime before 1973. Yep, GPS, Global Positioning System, a Black woman. What about the home heating ventilation system so that in the wintertime you can be warm from your basement up to your attic and all in between? A Black woman did that. Alice Parker in 1919, by the way, this stuff I'm telling you is documented in the official records of the U.S. Patent Office. You don't have to believe me, the angry black man, believe the records of the U.S. government. 
What about the home security alarm video system? Pretty much everybody got that kind of thing now. Well, the initial groundwork for the home security alarm video system came from a sister. Marie Brown in 1969, think about this, GPS, a black woman, 1973, home heating ventilation system, a black woman, 1919, and now we're talking about the home security alarm video system, a black woman, 1969. What about ice cream? Ice cream came, was invented or discovered, or I should say concocted by a black man who was able to ingeniously take ice and take milk and salt and put these things together in such a way that it created what we now know today as ice cream. Yep, a black man. That was way back in 1832. And remember, if slavery ended supposedly in 1865, this was more than 30 years before that. What about the light bulb? I know you think it was Thomas Edison, but not really. It was actually the assistant to Thomas Edison, a black man by the name of Louis Latimer. He did this in 1881. And here's the interesting thing. Thomas Edison did his thing two years earlier in 1879, but what he had was dull and temporary. His assistant, Louis Latimer, came up with something two years later that was bright and longer lasting. So the forerunner to today's light bulb was not Thomas Edison, it was Thomas Edison's assistant, a black man named Louis Latimer. Check this out. I gotta give Thomas Edison credit because he was a genius and he invented and developed and created stuff and people were trying to steal his idea and he would sue them for doing that. But check this out. He was involved in suing so many people who was trying to steal his stuff. He couldn't go to court all the time because one man can't do everything. He would send his assistant Louis Latimer to serve as an expert witness regarding Thomas Edison's invention. You didn't know that, did you? The black man was sent to court to testify on behalf of Thomas Edison. Powerful stuff. What about the modern day lock? Yeah, like door lock, stuff like that. Black man, Washington Madison in 1889. What about the potato chip? People say that it was the result of some sliced potatoes that got burnt. And there's probably some truth to that. But the person who did that said, hey, this thing will work. And it was a black man whose name is interesting. It's actually George Crumb. Crumb is spelled C-U-R-M, George Crumb. He was also known as George Speck, S-P-E-C-K. He came up with a potato chip as we know it today, way back in the early 1850s. And what about the refrigeration transport system? Like when you see all these frozen foods at the supermarket, well, where do they come from and how do they travel from point A to point B? Well, it's on those trucks. Those trucks got to be refrigerated. Who came up with the refrigeration transport system? You guessed it, a black man. His name, Frederick Jones, 1949. What about the remote control, the TV programmable? remote control that everybody has. You guessed it, a black man by the name of Joseph Jackson. He did this way back in 1978. All the stuff I'm telling you, you should know about it, but why don't you? Because we did it, they hit it. So that's the remote control slash TV programmable remote control. What about the blueprint for the telephone? In the same way that Thomas Edison used Louis Latimer as his top assistant. Alexander Graham Bell used the same person, Louis Latimer, as his assistant for the telephone blueprint. blueprint. So the blueprint, who everybody gives Alexander Graham Bell credit for, that blueprint, you guessed it, was developed and drafted by none other than Louis Latimer in 1878. So Louis Latimer really did the light bulb and Louis Latimer really did the telephone blueprint. Whew, powerful stuff. We got about 12, 13 minutes left. I'm gonna keep it moving. What about the thermostat temperature control system? You know how it is in the summertime, it's 100 degrees outside, you wanna cool off, you go to the thermostat. You know how it is in the wintertime, it's three degrees below zero and you wanna warm up, you go to your thermostat. Well, guess who did that? 
Yep, you're right. A black man. Frederick Jones did that in 1960. You want more, I got more. What about the traffic signal, which later developed into the traffic light? But that original traffic signal, a black man, Garrett Morgan in 1923. What about the trolley? You don't really see trolleys much anywhere. You got them in Philly. You got them in San Francisco. But the trolley, then known as the electric railway, yep, a black man. He did this in 1893. The name, you guessed it. Albert Robinson, a black man. Now, here's what I want to say before we wrap things up. And by the way, it's important that you all um, read the complete article that I wrote about this. I'm just flying through it right now. Um, you can read the complete article by going to phillytrib.com, type in CORD, C-O-A-R-D, and Black History Month, and all this stuff will come out. What I need to tell you before we wrap this up about Black History Month is the person who came up with all this stuff. His name is Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And this black man, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, he, back in February of 1926, 96 years ago, came up with what we know as Black History Month. But here's how it goes. Let me just read to you what I wrote. Precisely 96 years ago, in February 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, of which he was a co-founder, first celebrated Negro History Week. Now, follow me. It wasn't called Black History Month back then. It was called Negro History Week. And they first announced it in 1925, letting people know that it would go into effect in February of 1926. And they selected February because uh, Frederick Douglass was born in February and Abe Lincoln was born in February. That's what it selected. It wasn't because it was the this, this, this shortest month of the year. It had nothing to do with it. Now, remember, they came up with it in 1925, implemented it in 1926, and then in 1972, about 50 years later, it was renamed from Negro History Week to Black History Week in 1972. And then four years later, Black History Week became Black History Month in 1976. But check this out. And let me just read this part before we begin to wrap things up. In 1912, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, later recognized as the father of Black history, became the first person of enslaved parents to receive a PhD from Harvard University. And while a student at that elite Ivy League school and attending a lecture there, he was told by one of his professors that Africans and African-Americans, quote, had no history, unquote. Instead of merely getting angry, Woodson got even and did so through researching and organizing. And check this out. A little known fact about Negro History Week is that, as noted by the organization that he was a part of, Dr. Woodson, quote, never viewed black history as a one week affair. He pressed for schools to use Negro History Week to demonstrate what students learned all year. It was in this sense that blacks would learn of their past on a daily basis that he looked forward to the time when an annual celebration would no longer be necessary, unquote. Also, and it's from the organization, also, quote, he believed that black history was far too important to America and to the entire world to be crammed into a limited time frame. He spoke of a shift from Negro History Week to Negro History Year. That's what I'm talking about. Celebrated all year round. Don't just limit it to Africa because everything came out of Africa, which is why I call it world history every day. And this is what I also write. As a result of Dr. Woodson and his organization's meticulous research, as well as the meticulous research of African-centered scholars, such as, and write these names down, because all the stuff I'm sharing with you, this is where I got it from, such as Marimba Ani, Molefe Asante, Henry Baker, Charles Bloxham, Michael Bradley, Jacob Crothers, Sheikh Anta Joe, Asia Hilliard, Yosef Ben Yakinen, 
Edward Robinson, J.A. Rogers, Ivan Van Sertima, Francis Cress Wilson, Chancellor Williams, and many, many others. Great stuff by great African Center scholars. And again, if you want more information about this, read my article in the Tribune. Go to phillytrib.com, type in CORD, C-O-A-R-D, and type in Black History Month. Also, if you want to get information about these inventions and documented proof that they came from Black people in America or Black people in Africa, email me at michaelcordx at gmail.com. michaelcordx at gmail.com and say, yo, Mike, I need that. We did it. They hid it information, and I'll be happy to get it to you. By the way, I'm checking my Instagram. I'm checking my Twitter. And yes, I do have some questions and comments that sadly I won't be able to get to now, but I will get to, I promise you, I will get to you sometime after today's show. And our final six minutes, let me just walk you through my area of expertise, the criminal so-called justice system. By the way, next month, I'm going to tell you about this case I'm involved in. Um, just so you know, there's the Philadelphia Municipal Court on the lowest level, and you've got the Court of Common Pleas, and you've got the Superior Court. And next to Superior Court, you also have Commonwealth Court. At the very top, you have the State Supreme Court. Well, in those other appellate courts, that being the Superior Court and the Commonwealth Court, if you don't like something that took place in the Common Pleas Court, you just go straight to the Superior Court and you make your argument. Well, you go straight to the Commonwealth Court and you make your argument and you win or lose. But you can't just go up to the Supreme Court. And the reason you can't just go to the Supreme Court is because there are so many people, so many lawyers, and so many legal issues trying to get the Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, hold it. You can't just come in and appeal. You got to knock on the door. And we'll say, who is it? And you'll say, Joe Blow. The Supreme Court will say, what do you want? And they'll, you'll say, I want to argue X, Y, Z. And they'll say, why do you want to argue X, Y, Z? And you'll say, why? And they'll say, that's not good enough. And they'll slam the door. So with the other appellate courts, you just walk through the door and you argue your appeal. With the Supreme Court, you got to knock on the door and ask for permission. Well, about 99% of the applications to the Supreme Court are rejected. Only about 1% get through to make their arguments. I'm proud to tell you that on a big case I'm working on, I'm not going to say too much about it now, except to say it's a murder case and it's in some other county, not in Philadelphia. They were doing some tricky stuff out that I didn't like. So I went to the common pleas court, didn't get the justice I wanted, went to the superior court, didn't get the justice I wanted. And despite the fact that 99% of all applications to the Supreme Court are rejected, Supreme Court said, hey, Michael Cord, we're not saying we're going to grant your argument, but we think there's enough merit in it that we're going to make you part of the 1% and let you come in and argue your case. So I got to be in Harrisburg sometime in March to argue this case. And I'm only saying that to say that that's part of my expertise in criminal law. So my final four minutes, five minutes today, let me walk you through the criminal so-called justice system. Remember, if you got other questions about other stuff, could be civil law, an auto accident case. It could be medical malpractice. It could be uh, motor vehicle law. It could be domestic relations, administrative law, whatever it is, real estate law. Just email me. I'll be happy to help you. MichaelCordX at gmail.com. But now, find a few minutes. Let me just walk you through the criminal law process. First, you get arrested, which means the cop stops you or comes to your house and says you're accused of a crime and lock you up. That's the first thing. You get arrested. Second thing is you're taken to the police station where you're processed. That means you're fingerprinted and photographed. That's the second step. That could take anywhere from an hour to two, three, four, five, six hours. That's the second step. Third step, you might be interrogated. If you forget everything I said today, remember this. Anytime the police try to question you, sit down and shut up. Don't answer any questions. I mean, you could say your name and your address and that kind of thing. But don't say anything about whatever you've been arrested for. Don't say you did it. Don't say you didn't do it. Don't say you know the victim. Don't say you don't know the victim. Don't say you heard about it. Don't say you didn't hear about it. Why? Because, and you've seen this on cop shows everywhere, police have to 
read you your rights. That's called the Miranda warning. We don't have enough time to go through it. But all you need to know about the Miranda warning is this. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Let me repeat that. Anything you say can and will be used against you. So why would you say anything? Anything you say to the cop about the case can be used against you, not for you, but against you. So if that Miranda decision says that anything you say can and will be used against you, why would you say anything? So remember, going back, first you get arrested, then you get processed, then you might be interrogated. If you are interrogated, don't say anything except to the lawyer, just, just except to the cop, I want my lawyer. So if you want to say anything, just say, I want my lawyer. That's it. Don't admit to anything. Don't deny anything. Just say, I want my lawyer. That's the third step, the possible interrogation. The fourth step is something called the preliminary arraignment. And that's where three things happen. One, they set your bail if it's a bailable offense, because first degree murder and second degree murder, you don't get any bail. But all, mostly all other crimes, you are eligible for bail. So in that uh, fourth step, that preliminary arraignment, one, they set your bail, two, tell your charges, and three, give you a preliminary hearing date. That's pretty much it. That's it. That's all it is. And let me just see here if somebody's trying to reach me. Um, so that's the preliminary arraignment. That's the fourth step in the process. The fifth step in the process is the preliminary hearing. That's where a judge decides, does the case proceed forward or is the case thrown out? At a preliminary hearing, a judge doesn't decide if you're guilty or not guilty. The judge just wants to know if the case should go forward. And how's the case, how's the judge decide if a case should go forward? Very simple. Two questions. I don't care whether it's a minor matter or a major murder. Two questions. One, is there any, not strong, is there any evidence that a crime was committed? And two, is there any evidence that the defendant was involved? If there is any evidence, sufficient evidence, we lawyers call that prima facie evidence or probable cause evidence. If there's any evidence that a crime has been committed, any prima facie evidence, any probable cause evidence that a crime was committed, and two, any evidence, sufficient evidence that you were involved, then that's it for the preliminary hearing. The judge is going to say, hey, I'm not finding you guilty. I'm not finding you not guilty. I'm simply saying there's enough evidence to go to trial. That's the fifth step in the process, the preliminary hearing. After that, there's something called the formal arraignment, which is different from the preliminary arraignment. At the preliminary arraignment, they tell your charges, they set your bail, and they schedule a preliminary hearing. Now we're talking about a formal arraignment, which comes after the preliminary hearing. At that formal arraignment, and it's kind of a new system now based on technology, but basically this is what happens. They want to know who your lawyer is going to be for trial. They'll provide you with discovery and they'll give you a pretrial date. You want to know who your trial lawyer is going to be, provide you with discovery. Discovery means that when a crime is allegedly committed, police are called and the police investigate the crime. And when the police investigate the crime, they discover stuff. And when they discover stuff, that's called discovery. They got to give that to your lawyer. And then there's a pretrial conference schedule. That means you come back in about a month or more to see if everybody's ready for trial. Then the next step is the trial. And if you lose, there's a sentencing. And if after the sentencing you want to appeal, you can. That's it in a nutshell. We're running out of time. Let me just say, if folks want to reach me and get more information about any of the stuff I talk about, Black History Month as world history every day, or you want information about any type of legal stuff, check me out by emailing me at microcourtx at gmail.com. Don't forget to watch my radio show called Radio Courtroom at WURD 96.1 FM every Saturday at 11 a.m. I'm sorry, at 1 p.m. It used to be Sunday at 11 a.m., but every Saturday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., WURD 96.1 FM. And today's show, like and every show, think black. I'm out.